My name is Eitan Chatayat and welcome to I'm That Podcast, where I get to talk to some pretty incredible people. Some are friends and colleagues, some are clients, and some are people I haven't even met yet. On I'm That, we'll hear from them about who they are, what they do and why, stuff they love or hate, mistakes they've made, victories they've had. They're all known for something, but by the time we're through, the hope is they'll have revealed some things we didn't know about them. Our talk may be deep, profound, funny, who knows really. One thing for sure, it'll be interesting and honest. So if you're up for that, thank you for joining me on I'm That, and here we go. Born in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Sandra Hegedus studied philosophy and cinema at the prestigious, and I will botch this up, Fundichao and Mando Alvarez Pantedao, and as a militant artist of the Paula scene, she realized several performances in the early 80s before arriving in France in 1990, where she started an activity as a documentary film and reported producer. Her passion for art led her to build a collection of contemporary art in 2005. And her desire to be more involved in supporting artistic creation naturally drew her to patronage. So in 2009, she created SAM Art Projects, which promotes the work of foreign artists in France and French artists abroad through the awarding of a prize and residencies. And in order to encourage exchange and dialogue, the supported projects bring together the Parisian art scene with countries beyond the usual circuits of the art world. Now, Sandra belongs to a generation of activist collectors who've made their mark on the French landscape in recent years creating daring philanthropic projects, nurturing the talents of tomorrow, and sponsoring ambitious projects that transcend borders, like her collection. The artistic creations she supports don't respond to a concern for the market, but really to an acute attention to new visions of the world that artists bring. Now, I know Sandra personally, she's got boundless energy and surrounds herself with really dedicated partners and experts which actually lets her carry out artists' projects and providing them with visibility and recognition. Now, in 2018, her commitment was rewarded with the 27th Mont Blanc Prize for Culture Art Patronage, recognizing her work in supporting international artistic exchanges, building bridges between Europe and non-Western countries. In 2020, she was even named an Officer of the Legion of Honor by the French Minister of Culture. Since November of 2019, she's held the position of president of the board of directors of the Villa Arson, a national public institution under the authority of the Minister of Culture, combining an art center, an artist residence, an art school, and a specialized library. Sandra, it's been a while. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Where are you right now? Right now I'm in Paris. Just arrived. And we'll be here for a week before going to Senegal to check out the African art scene. You are, I think, one of the most well-traveled people I know. I mean, we met each other, just so that people know, by starting to follow each other on Instagram. And we formed a connection. <laughs> You've come over for dinner at my house in Tel Aviv with my family. But I just like, I can't keep up with you. You're always somewhere. I know. I know. I have to stop. But I just can't. It just... Keeps on going and going and uh, yeah, but I came to your place. That's good, right? It was amazing. You got to meet my mom and dad. Exactly. The whole family. <laughs> yeah, it was great. And where did you come from right now? Because I know that you just landed in Paris, right? Uh, it was a long weekend and I was in the south of France in Saint-Tropez, just mm. chilling. <laughs> just chilling. Well, listen, first of all, before we, before we begin, where can people follow you like I followed you at the beginning? What's your handle on Instagram? It's Sandra Mullier Ejedus. Sandra okay. Mullier Ejedus. You can write it down. Yeah, and I'll, I'll write it down in the in in the in the bio. Look, I want to get straight to the to the talk because, you know, something happened in in your career recently, and it's not the most comfortable situation. And of course, I know about it, but I wanted to I, I wanted to hear your story. Because quite literally, I think you're the first person in the whole world to defund an art center. Um, and we're talking about Palais de Tokyo. And rather than um, viewers hearing it from me, I think it's so important in the world that we're living in today, which is a totally and complete upside down world, that we hear your story and your experience and uh, just hear it straight from straight from you with no bullshit. So with that, 
maybe you can just talk about what Palais de Tokyo is, your relationship with them, and what happened that led you to defund an art center and in doing so, go totally viral and not in the most positive way. Okay, so first of all, I've been doing this this project, Sam Art Projects, since 2009. Since 2009, Palais de Tokyo has had uh, five d- different directors, and I've worked with all of them in a very um, good way, uh, good partnerships. And um, so I've been providing them with two, three shows a year, my resident artist and the prize. And what we do is that uh, outside of Paris de Tokyo, we will produce the whole show and deliver like a meal, you know, like a, like everything. All they have to do is have the chair, the table, and, and the plates and eat the meal. And for people who don't know what this, you know, that are new to this world, what, what does that actually mean in an event when you, you know, Palais de Tokyo, what is it? Okay, Palais de Tokyo is an art center. It's the biggest art center in Europe. It's uh, it's huge. It has three seasons, which means they change their shows three times a year. And inside the Palais de Tokyo, you can see, you go there and you can see several different shows. And, uh, and I would provide around three per year. Mm. Until the new director came and we, I saw very clearly that we were not, you know, in the same mindset. First of all, Since um, 2020 and the rise of anti-Semitism, I have been posting more and more on my Instagram because it's a good platform. I have a lot of followers and mostly non-Jewish. So I said, it's a good platform to have allies, to show Judaism in a positive way, in a proud way, and explain things. So I've been doing this for four years. Okay, well, well, let's talk about that for a second. I mean, we know right now as we're recording, you know, there's, this is a post-October 7th world, a horrendous and horrific attack by Hamas on Israel. And since then, we've seen all of this Jew hatred spout up around the world. And you're Jewish. I mean, let's, I mean, I don't think that you said that. What does that mean? What does very mean? (laughs) I feel very Jewish. I love my Judaism and I'm very proud. And I think it's in reaction to what my grandparents lived through because they are a Holocaust survivors and they were very traumatized and they would be hiding their Judaism. And I'm, you know, like showing it very, very proudly. And and I'm a very proud Zionist. So I think you told me when you were over for dinner with my family, something about your family was saved, right? In the yeah. Holocaust. By who? Yes, they were saved uh, in Budapest by uh, uh, Swedish diplomat Raoul Wallenberg. And thanks to him, I'm here talking to you. That's something that not a lot of people know, but in, in those days and in, in the Holocaust, it was very difficult to find people that would speak up for the Jewish people as they were being targeted, let alone save them. So I can imagine, I mean, knowing you, I know how fiercely proud you are. And I mean, I, I think it's amazing that you're so vocal, especially with your platform. So so let's get back to that. So you're you're very open about being Jewish. You're very open about being a Zionist, believing in a state for the Jewish people, which is the land of Israel, which is actually what a, a, a Zionist is. Mm-hmm. And, and what next? So, yeah, so so as I am from Brazil, after the war, my family immigrated to Brazil and I was born there. And so I've been talking about art mostly on my Instagram. It's mostly art, culture, travel. But as um, I'm followed by all these people who love art and culture, I started in a very natural way, uh, inserting stuff about Israel and Judaism, just, you know, to make it like in a very natural way. Of course, the people who don't like that, and there are many who don't like that in the art world, because the art world in France, uh, unfortunately, is infested with anti-Semites. They have this narrative about Palestine. And mind you, I am not anti-anybody. I'm not anti-anybody in Palestine. 
you know and and I know that being for the the self determination of the Jewish people and their homeland doesn't mean to be against their self determination either. But these people don't think uh, like that, and they and they believe that there's only place for one people, and that's not us. But they have control of these venues, right? So they can show whatever they choose to show. Yeah, you know, it's it's. I think it's important to kind of like just, if if I may, just for a second, when you talk about the art world, the art world typically, and, and the creative world, because I come from the creative world having been a copywriter and I'm a creative director and I worked in advertising in, in, in New York and Boston and, and, and some other places, is that typically people from the arts lean left because of very, very liberal values. And right now, you know, I think that we're aware of the fact that the entire left is being played by believing certain things that are not true and aligning with with certain people that that makes no sense and hence my upside down world that we're living in common. It's it's very complicated because when you say left, it lost its meaning. It doesn't left right doesn't mean anything anymore. It's very complicated because of this woke point of view where there's the oppressed and the oppressor and nothing in between. It's black and white. So either you're oppressed or you're the oppressor. And and of course, all these decolonial movement that sees Israel as a colonial movement because they have this narrative. For me, Israel is the most important decolonial act that ever was because we decolonized from the English, from the Arabs, from everybody to come back to our homeland, you know, from, Jews are from Judea. But for some reason, somewhere doesn't believe that. I don't know why they believe that Arabs are from there. I I say, and I repeat, Arabs are from Arabia. Jews well, are yeah, from it's, Judea. It's a very, um, I mean, a lot of people don't know this. I mean, we know it because we're Jewish and we live this, but... It's basically propaganda. The Arabs did arrive from Arabia, which is fine, you know, with hundreds fine. of years ago, and I think somewhere between 600 and 800 AD. And they colonized the entire Middle East, and they've stayed there ever since. And uh, even though in 1948, when the UN petition plan happened, and the Jewish people that were living there who had been arriving, and there had always been a, a presence of Jewish people in the state, accepted the partition plan, the Arabs on that land who are not Palestinians, they're called Palestinians now, but Palestinian, kind of like the Palestinians as we know them today was uh, something that was created by Yasser Arafat in the 60s. You know, these the Arabs on that land didn't accept the petition plan. We uh, were attacked, you know, the Jewish people were attacked by five Arab armies and we stayed and won the war. And since then, we've been fighting against the lies of those Arabs and the surrounding Arabs who really hate the presence of the Jewish nation there. That is the reason. I know you say you, we don't know why, but I think no, it's no, a simple... No, we do know why. We, but the world doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, the world doesn't know, but the world used to love the Jews when they were dying or victims. The conquering Jews, they don't like. Jews that who defend themselves, they do not like. So it's very complicated because I don't want to be a dead Jew. You don't want to be a dead Jew. Uh, and we will defend ourselves. It's over. You know, the weak, uh, trembling need Jew, it, that's over. That's true. And we must recognize, like, we have to stop blaming the Europeans for colonizations. Yes, okay, it happened. But we, if we attack colonization, we have to t talk about Arab colonization as well that went all the way to Spain and France. They, they got pushed out, but they still colonized the whole north of Africa. And that's a fact. Yeah, so it's if a you fact. speak uh, Arab in Morocco, it's not because uh, native Moroccans spoke Arab. No, they were uh, uh, Amazigh, they were Berbers, and they had their own language and culture and religion. But the colonizers imposed their language and culture. This is the definition of uh, colonization. Yeah, and it's an uncomfortable fact that a lot of people don't know about because it requires reading and education and and not changing history to learn. The, 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 the thing that you started saying was oppressor and oppressed. And 
something that you and I have talked about before is that in this world, in this culture that we live in today, anyone who is supposedly oppressed is immediately a victim. And anyone who is stronger and is deemed an oppressor is automatically evil. So when the Palestinian narrative and the, the, the narrative that Israel has faced since its creation of being called an oppressor, even though it's not true, spreads as a lie, then we find ourselves in the situation that we are in today when 16 million Jews or you know 0.2% of the population are Jewish, our truth is being drowned out by a narrative of around 1.5, 1.6 billion Muslims who I don't think are bad people, but their leaders have perpetuated this lie and we're outnumbered. So it's very understandable for me today why why this oppressed versus oppressor narrative is winning on media and on social media, even though it's not true. But let's get back to you. So yeah, but so, you know, if you tell a young person, these are the bad guys, look what they do, they kill babies. I'm 20, I'm going to be, I'll go crazy. I'm going to say these guys are really bad. So back to the responsibility of schools and art uh, spaces. If you have people uh, programming exhibitions where you have the good guy and the bad guy and the bad guy is always the Jew, then these these spaces are open to schools, to young people, to to anybody, and they're going to believe this because the people who do this, if it's in a museum, an art center, a school, then they are the authority and we believe in that authority. If it's under the... Um, uh, control of the Ministry of Culture and they're doing this exhibition means it's true. So it's very, very irresponsible to do this kind of thing. And I put the finger in the... <laughs> where it hurts, you know? I put the finger where it hurts and I wrote a... a, a well, how do you call it when you renounce a job? When you, I, I, like I wrote... You. A, I I quit the the job and you resigned. Uh, I resigned from the um, from the council from the board of the Friends of Palais de Tokyo, which is a board that supports financially the Palais de Tokyo in several different ways, and we do fundraisers and we do all that. Saying that. Uh, I just cannot be connected with this institution at this moment with the new direction, which is clearly anti-Semitic with a woke uh, vision of oppressor and press. And if I contribute in any way financially or with my presence or with any work that I do, it means that I am agreeing with it. So I have to very clearly uh, state that I do not want to be connected with that. And I was more uh, aggressive with that, saying that those who stay, knowing that this is happening, are collaborating. So let me ask you a question. Though. Did you have these private conversations with them? Did you have a dialogue with them before you submitted that letter of resignation from the board? I wrote to them. I wrote to them. I talked to them. I wrote to them on their post. Uh, on Instagram saying, uh, is it the role of this institution to show this kind of work at this time during a war with a biased uh, unilateral view? Uh, I questioned them on all that. Nobody called me. Nobody. They didn't respond. Reacted. No. How long did you wait? How long and did you wait before you went uh, public? Oh, months. Guys... Months. I wrote and then time passed and then. I knew they discussed about it because I have uh, information about that, but mm -hmm. nobody reached out, nobody talked to me, and they are very arrogant and they think that they have the right to do everything, but no, they don't, actually. So what happened? So what happened is that they went crazy because this went viral worldwide and uh, created a precedent, right? So if I can do this, any patron can do this. Any patron can say, wait a second, where's my money going? Is my money supporting things I don't believe in and that I cannot, you know, give my, you know, I, I, can, I, can, I cannot give any money or anything? So you, so 
they accused me of censoring the the institution, which was very perverse because I was censoring no one. I told the director, you are free to do what you want, but then I am also free. Freedom goes both ways. So you do this, I react like that. And the, the thing is that now they are scared that more people will do this and defund and, and even like, um, you know, uh, companies who who want their logos there and they will not want to be connected with that anymore. So it so, can create a domino effect. So what was this, what was this show? I mean, because from what I understood, from what I read, it didn't really seem like art. It didn't seem like an art show. To me, it seemed like, like literally propaganda. But you tell me. Exactly. That's also part of the problem. This is an art center. Uh, you go there to see art. There's a place called the National Library here in Paris, and they do shows, and they do shows with uh, documents, uh, photography, you know, documentation. And it could have been a show for that place, but with the right explanation and mediation to explain the context. But it had... No place at the Palais de Tokyo. There was no art whatsoever. It was uh, Xerox, the uh, uh, papers of propaganda from the 70s, children's book, books from uh, Palestine accusing Israel of being the enemy of the good guys who took their homes, but the, the good guys will fight and will get their homes back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, texts that you wouldn't believe they were. Like, I could not believe my eyes that these things could be on in a museum in France, just sitting there without mediation, without explanation, out of context in a in the period of war. So what what you're saying is that when you would walk into the museum, there was basically an exhibition that portrayed a very false reality with no, you know, because the the Middle Eastern situation, specifically Israel vis-a-vis -vis Palestine, is not simple for most people to understand. And you're saying that Israel was just painted to be the bad, bad guy. The bad yeah. guy with no of explanation course. and no. right. And so this even is the worse. thing that yeah, go ahead. Even worse. The explanation was even worse because it, it made a parallel with apartheid in South Africa and uh, the the dictatorship of Pinochet in Chile. And it the Palestinians, the South Africans and the victims of this dictatorship were put in parallel with obviously Pinochet's uh, dictatorship, apartheid, uh, South Africa and Israel being the bad guys. And this this show is a historic show which was made in the in the seventies, the time of Yasser Ar Arafat, and it was uh, shown in Beirut. It was supposed to be something like museums uh, in exile, museum of people who had no uh, land, and artists donated their works to this museum, which would be the Museum of Palestine one day. But the thing is, these works are not being shown. There are no artworks being shown. It's mainly propaganda. So you drew the line. You I can did. you tell me can you tell me what what did it feel like in the months as you were waiting? Because I'm sure it's it's not an easy situation to be in. You're you're a part of something that is absolutely against your principles because it's very clear to me that this is not you opposing freedom of speech. This is you opposing the irresponsibility of an actual institution that is being highly immoral and irresponsible and forcing down the throat of people things without context and things that are very potentially divisive and things that are actually untrue. So tell me how it felt for you in those couple of months as you were waiting for a response and also what was the trigger, how you finally made the decision to take this extraordinarily brave step in your world and publicly make a resignation? Yeah, it's something that people don't do here. Um... Well, as you know, October 7 was a line that, you know, after October 7, nothing was the same. So we could not see things in the same way as we had before. Little anti-Semitic things, little 
bubbles would burst here and there, but we were not in the same state that we are in right now. Uh, after October 7, we all changed. You know, we all changed. It's never going to be the same. It's never going to be so the same. You, what, what, tell, tell me, because I know, but but the viewers might not know. We have some, a lot of non-Jewish people listening. So what, what's not the same? What What's not the same is that... Um, you know, we were always very liberal and progressive and defending all causes and Black Lives Matter. And we were there and then uh, giving money here and there and, and helping and doing all we could uh, and very and defending all the minorities we could. But when this happened to the Jews on October 7, the world was silent. And it's that silence that I heard because what happened on October 7, it happens again and again in our Jewish lives, but that the world was silenced when women were being raped, uh, when people were being kidnapped, were kids, uh, you know, like civilians. And that, that was, you know, what exploded everything for me. So do you think that the world was silent? I mean, I remember that the world did speak up, but I, I don't know if it's that the world was silent. Maybe it's that that very quickly, you know, the, 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 the haters came out very quickly and we saw them immediately, the Jewish people. The next day. The next day, yeah, exactly. But but October 8th, I saw people posting Palestinian flags and jubilating and saying, finally, you know, and and people in the art world were doing that. And it was very shocking. Yeah, so the silence that you speak of is, is um, when when... You framed it as Black Lives Matter and, and you mentioned women now. And I think I'm just trying to kind of like translate what you said because it's a very important point that you're making. That the Jewish people really, as a minority, supports other minorities, not because we want anything, but I think that the Jewish people support other minorities because it's a minority and it feels the pain of ostracized societies. And the silence that you're speaking of you mentioned women. How can it be that there are women talking for many years, for almost a decade, about women's rights, sexual violence against women, women's position in the workplace, abortion rights, these things on, on LinkedIn and, and, and everywhere. And me too. Oh, and me too. But when it comes to the, to the kidnapping and gang raping and raping and murder and mutilation of women who are being held hostage, the, there is a silence from many, many, many women. And the same thing from the black Shocking. community. It's, 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 we were there. I think that's what you're saying. We were there for the black community. Where are you when we are being uh, oppressed and killed? And this is where the, the, the twist is, the upside down world is that I think a lot of people are afraid to, to support the Jewish people because of this war situation, because it might mean that they're supporting Israel and supporting Israel is unpopular because we're outnumbered and, and it's a domino effect. But this silence is what you felt. And I think I'm feeling anger from you from that silence. Yes, I was, I was very angry and I was very angry with the, the rhetoric that came out and how the word Zionist became like a bad word. And it only means, you know, the right to self-determination of the Jewish people and their ancestral homeland. And all of a sudden it, it became an insult. And it's 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 very crazy. And the bullying and um yeah. So it was it was very shocking. So things changed. And you know. Jews have been giving money and, and doing philanthropy. It's part of our culture to do that. You know how it is in the, in the United States. It's very big and no questions asked. And, and we're the good guys and everybody loves us because we are generous. And But all of a sudden I said, wait, we must question. We cannot continue just giving without questioning. What do you mean questioning? Because otherwise we are collaborating to that. What do you mean questioning? Questioning where our money goes. Let me give you an example. Imagine your son goes to a soccer club. You take him every 
Saturday, you support the club. You, when they do a fundraiser, you give some money to support the club. The kids in their neighborhood go there. Everything's all right. Then the director changes and the new guy is a Nazi. What do you do? You continue supporting? Do you take your kid there? Or you, things change. So we cannot just go on as before, you know, not questioning. The direction changes and you think that things are not going as they should. You have to question it because otherwise one day you're going to be questioned about what you did and you're going to be a collaborator. It sounds to me like it's it's the first step is to question, but you're actually talking about consequences. When you figured out that your money is being spent on things which are detrimental to you know, the, the positivity of the direction of Western civilization, for example. Exactly. Then the consequence is that you're going to leave. And not only that you're going to leave, is that you might take some people with you. So what was the what was the trigger? What was the what was the straw that broke the camel's back, Sandra, for you to just like say, enough of this shit? It was that. It was that show. It was that show. And I said, these guys are doing that show with public money and with money from companies who want their logos there or, you know, uh, partnerships. And they do that. They do what they want and nobody questions. So, okay, I will not censor them, but I don't want to play with them anymore. I'm going to take my 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 ball and I'm going to play with other other people. So you could have done that quietly, but you decided to make it public. Yeah. Why? Because I want this to be an example. I want other people to follow. I want people to start questioning if they want to participate in that or not. Because when all this will be over and that we we start, you know, reconstructing and it's like after the war. Where were you during the war? What role did you play? Are you proud of the role you played? Questions will be asked. Are you the guy who was financing them? This? Not me, but are you? So I'm, I told the rest of the group, I'm out of here. Those who stay agree with this and continue to finance this. And I left. So I, you know, I threw a, a big <laughs> uh, rock <laughs> in the pond and, you know, it splashed all over and, and, and people started saying, you, hell no, I don't want to be part of this either. Oh, really? Of course. Don't tell me. Yeah. A lot of people are not uh, uh, continuing uh, supporting uh, this institution. They are, are talk- will stop. Yeah. Palais are you Tocco. talking about like a, a, a Jewish people, non-Jewish people? Not only Jewish, non-Jewish as well. Because it's not about Jewish. It's about our civilization. Western civilization is under attack and the Jews are just the canary in the mine, you know? And people know, people know, and but they never questioned themselves. It was just, we have, you know, to give the money because that's what we've been doing. And all of a sudden I said, no, you don't have to. You can stop. You can have an opinion. You can say, I don't want this. And it's not censorship. It's you guys do it, but without me. So your kind of resignation, we said, went viral. What has been the... The response that you're seeing on, I guess, in the press, in social media, what's the response? So the center and right wing press is with me and the more extreme left press is against me and trying to um, make a caricature of all this and saying, and so they made a, like, you know, where you sign and they told all the artists and everybody that Palais de Tokyo yeah. was under mm-hmm. attack. Huh? Yeah, you like know. Pe- petitions, yeah. Yeah, petitions against the... They didn't put my name, but it was like obvious that it was against me and people were signing and, and even people I know, uh, artists that I have in my collection, artists that I gave my prize to, and they were acting as if I was a very terrible person, you know, trying to, to censor art or a museum, which is not the case. They do what they want. It's just that I, I'm not going to be part of it. 
When you think back to the moment that you wrote the letter and you put it out there, how did it make you feel? A big relief. Yeah. A big relief because it, you know, I took it out, out of me and, um, and it was, you know, because I was feeling very, very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. And people were writing to me saying, have you seen this show? Uh, you're part of this uh, committee and you're, you know, you're in this. And, and I said, no, I do not want to be part of this. And I don't want to be connected to this. And I want, want to make this very clear. And so it was clear. Let's, let's talk about, well, first of all, I, I, I hold you in very high, high regard, as, as you know. But even more so after this, because I, I mean, I guess I can empathize. Uh, people know me as as uh, as as always having spoken up for my Jewish heritage, and even now, um, I think there are quite a few people who are willingly putting their necks on the line professionally, as I'm also doing with my with my business to to speak my truth with action, though, and I think that. What you're doing is very brave. It's an action. It's not just talking. It's not just letting things go. You took a real step and you have actually led, hoping that people will follow. Is that something that, um, I know you, at the beginning we said that you're very proud uh, to be Jewish and you're a very proud Zionist. What do you think should be happening in the world right now so that people can be less scared of not doing something that might get them into trouble? You mean the people who are doing th these kinds of exhibitions? I mean, just in general. I mean, it could, be, it could be anything, right? I mean, in your case, it's art. But maybe it could be, you know, for example, Macklemore, the, the rapper who decided to put out a song, which is all very well to sing about freeing Palestine, but to not talk about who Hamas is, to not talk about hostages, to also kind of like in his songs, sing lies about, about us. A consequence would be, you know, other artists coming out and speaking up against him, which only a handful have done. So, I mean, it can be in art, it can be in music, it can be in my profession, it can be in construction work or retail. What's going to shake people out of their apathy and start doing the right thing? It's very complicated because, as you said, we're very few. And then there's the economic power of uh, countries like Qatar, uh, who are financing, at the end of the day, they are financing all this and uh, putting in place their uh, pawns, you know. So uh, what's happening in the university is no surprise what happens in Harvard, Yale, NYU, et cetera, because uh, they have been gifted uh, with a lot of money from countries such as Qatar and, and the consequences we are seeing right now. So it's very complicated. I don't know how we can fight this because... The question of the funding is uh, is a big question, but then there's the question of the morality of all this, and does Western civilization want to commit suicide or not? At one time, there has to be a decision. Do we just take the money and we don't care, or do we say, wait, what future do we want for our kids? What kind of country do we want to, them to live in, and what kind of world? Are you encouraged? By anything like the fact that you stepped down and you said that other people, you know, have 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 it sounded like or have said the same thing to you. Are you encouraged? Are you hopeful? Encouraged? I am hopeful. I'm always hope. I'm a very hopeful person. I'm a positive person. I think things comes in cycles, and we've, you know, our grandparents have have lived through things like this, and now it's again, it's again, you know, anti-Semitism is strong again, and. But in a different way, because they are not the laws of the countries. At, at the time of the Nazis, you know, there were laws that, you know, said Jews could not go in here or there. Right now, there are no laws. Students uh, are, are doing this kind of thing, and um, we are seeing this. I don't know if enough people are seeing the kind of booklets that they have in their encampments and uh, uh, how they're being manipulated. I hope... Law uh, enforcement people are seeing this, uh, politicians are seeing this, 
And I hope it's not too late to save uh, our civilization, but I don't know. Are you worried for, for France? I mean, I know that there's a... I'm very worried for France. But it's funny, because I did this, I was... There are people who have no, nothing else to do but to do lists of uh, people to boycott or to cancel. So I'm now I'm in all these lists. What I, I call them lists of order. And it's crazy how they they do this propaganda and they do this canceling thing. And it, I mean, it's pathetic. It doesn't sound very hopeful. But you were hopeful. jealous, weren't you? You were <laughs> jealous not to be on that list. I would be proud to be on a list of haters of Western civilization. Bring it, you know. I feel, though, that that the middle ground has to wake up. And I'm wondering what it's going to take. What is it going to take for the middle ground to wake up and see that radical Islam, because it's not Islam, but radical Islam and its propaganda and taking advantage of the Western way and that's what that's what radical islam does it gets in to a culture and then it takes advantage of the freedoms of that culture to use it against it and then and then in in that way slowly become a, a forceful voice in that culture and you see that happening everywhere and i'm just wondering if the only thing that can that can stop that which i really don't want is another Charlie Hebdo, another 9-11, uh, another round of London bus bombings or the Spain bombings or the Boston Marathon. I mean, or the, you know, the Christians being killed by radical, you know, Muslims. But it's in every day in France. Every day there are knife, knife attacks and uh, uh, there was a synagogue attack uh, last Friday, you know, just before Shabbat in Rouen. The guy was killed, but still, you know, he tried to attack a synagogue, a Jewish school. There was a woman with knives approaching the school while she was retained, but it's happening every day. Uh, kids are being killed. Teachers, school teachers are being killed. Not too long ago, a couple of years ago, a, a professor in the school was decapitated in front of the school. Jewish. So I don't know what it takes. No, not Jewish. Not Jewish. Not Jewish, but because he showed the caricatures uh, of Mohammed in school uh, to talk about the right to express yourself in France and the freedom of expression, he was decapitated in front of the school. Like, this is all connected. It's like, you know, when we talk about what you did with Palais de Tokyo and refusing to be associated with propaganda, which you feel is, is radical. And celebrating, you know, I don't think, you know, you said this also at the beginning, you're not against the Palestinian people and you're not, not against a Palestinian state, I imagine, living side by side in peace with Israel. But That's all we want. That's all we want, right. So it's just interesting how this conflict is being fueled and spreading down to the point where, you know, as you just said, there are so many incidents in France that are going on, which are really the result of radical Islam. And one thing that I don't think that the average person understands is that in Gaza, there is radical Islam. I mean, Hamas is a radical Islamic terrorist organization, and 75 to 85% of the people before, during, and after also support Hamas. So they're, they've been radicalized. That's really crazy. That's really the, crazy that... They don't realize that it's not a question of uh, of wanting a land, but it's a question of um, imposing a caliphate, you know, and that these people from Hamas, they're not, it's not about the land. The land has been proposed several times, five times, I think. Yeah. There have it's been a uh, uh, proposals to have a, a two-state solution. Sandra, I think that we could keep, keep talking for, for hours about this, but I know that you have to get somewhere and I'm cognizant of the time. <laughs> I want to say a couple of things before we wrap. One is you are my Brazilian badass and you always will be. You always. Are, always. You're amazing. And I, I so commend your, your morality and your bravery and fearlessness 
And I really hope that more people take from you the example of not doing something irrationally, but you questioned, you applied critical thinking, you dug deep, you reached out, you tried to try to get to the bottom of what was going on and to say that it wasn't cool. You were ignored, you resigned, and by doing so, you are making a statement. And I think that that is so needed in this world right now. It's a fearlessness. And that's not to say that the people on the other side don't have the right to question. They do. But at some stage, you have to come to the table and you have to have dialogue and move forward together. And this cancel culture, this ignoring people, this intolerance to the encouragement of debate is very toxic. And I see in you a warrior that is fighting through activism, which is something that I think is really needed and for the people, the good people in the world to wake up. So I just on a personal level, thank you for, for being that person. I wish there were more of you. Well, I wish there were more people like you. It's done. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. Thank you for joining me on I'm That. I hope you enjoyed the chat and I hope you'll join me for our next guest. In the meantime, definitely hit subscribe. Whether you're on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, or any other platform. And if you can, leave a comment, give it a like, and tell your friends. That would be brilliant. Stay tuned for the next show, and see you soon.